Jesus Christ, our living hope. There is no greater hope than you, Lord. Even when we can't hope, you are our hope. The truth that you are our living hope does not change, even when we can't hope in you. We thank you that you are the truth that never changes. That your faithfulness reaches out throughout all generations. Father, we praise you for your son today. In the silence of our hearts, we praise you, we honor you for the great work you have done in Jesus Christ, your son. As the psalmist says, whom have I in heaven but you? There is none on earth that I desire besides you. Oh, may that be true of us today. May that be true of your people. Father, we worship you for who you are and for what you have done all across this nation. We praise you that your gospel is going forth all across this nation to the planting of churches that the gospel is the good news that your people people who have not even heard of your name desperately needs to hear it and oh I know that so many of us do not know that we need to hear this and that is the lostness that we are in and so father would you be pleased to make much of your son today and what he has done my greatest fear is today I will stand here in vain that my words will be human and that my words will not have power so make your word powerful hide hide me from your people and show Christ show us the beauty of his magnificency show us the beauty of the gospel that we have not yet seen with the eyes of our hearts Prone to wonder, Lord, our hearts, we feel it. Every second, so many things grabs for our attention. Every second, every moment, there is messages in our iPhones. There's all kinds of distractions. Oh, restless hearts, would you come to the living water? Restless hearts, would you draw, would you draw our restless hearts to find your rest in the one that we were made to see? and enjoy. Today I ask of you, Father, would you make much of Jesus to the preaching and teaching of your word. Give us eyes to see, give us ears to hear, and may we be changed into the likeness of Christ. The changes that you are going to bring is going to be wonderful. Even though it may be painful at times, Father, the end result is beauty. The end result is restoration. The end result is renewal. So I pray. I praise you, Father, for the great work that you are doing in this congregation. It is a privilege to herald to your people. I do not take this lightly, so I pray, Father, would you show up by your Spirit. If you do not show up, Father, this preaching is in vain. I ask for hearts that we, don't, we need you even to listen to you. We need your Spirit to woo us, to draw us into the text in order to see who Jesus is and what he has to say to us. So we invite you, Father. Holy Spirit, we invite you in the next few minutes. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Today we will be looking into Philippians chapter 1, verses 9, 1 to 11. Joy and fellowship in the gospel. Uh, here's some brief, brief uh, background before we go into the text. Uh, Philippi was a Roman colony and like Tokyo, it was a rich and busy place and one of the main centers of life in Macedonia. Uh, in Acts chapter 16, Paul, Silas, and Timothy had established the church at Philippi around AD 49. And at the time of writing, see, Paul, an early church leader, was held in prison for his religious beliefs. Uh, yet, uh, despite his suffering, this is remarkable, he was able to encourage others with joy. 
Uh, so from our text today, we're going to follow three main insights again. Uh, number one, the grace of God that brings us joy. Uh, number two, the good work that God works in us. Number three, the fruit of love that overflows to Christ. Number one, the grace of God that brings us joy, beginning with verse one. Paul and Timothy, servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi, with the overseers, the, that is the elders and deacons, uh, verse two, grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Verse three, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. Verse four, always in every prayer of mine for you all, making my prayer with joy. Verse five, because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So what comes to your mind when you think of the word saints? Uh, why does Paul call the Philippian believers saints in verse 1. See, by calling them saints, Paul is not saying that they were perfect or sinless. Notice carefully, he calls them saints in Christ. Not outside of Christ, but in Christ. Uh, so my question to you today, this is a very, very important question that you can ever think for your life. Are you in Christ? Or are you outside of Christ? Are you in Christ or are you outside of Christ? Because the word saints here means those who are set apart. So right here we see again what Christianity is all about, right? No one is holy enough to be called a saint apart from God's grace, right? Sainthood is not a status you can earn by your good works. It is a gift of God's grace. So you become saints only by the grace of God, not by your own deeds, right? This is why Paul, calls, uh, uh, Paul says in verse 2, grace to you and peace from God. This is so important. My question to you today is, have you experienced two peace in your heart? Is your heart perpetually anxious, busy, and restless. Notice he says, grace and peace comes from God. The order is significant. Uh, before you can have genuine peace, your heart must rest from your internal works. Our hearts internally are busy. Our thoughts are restless. As that famous hymn says, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it in my heart. The heart is restless and so before you can have genuine peace in your heart peace that comes from God your heart must rest from your works your internal works that is so busy right it means you must receive God's grace in your heart you must experience it, it you should not know it only in your head it must go from your head into your heart like a coin drops into your heart it should drop in there it should not linger here otherwise you will not know two peace right so it says basically you must receive God's grace experience it in your heart God's grace is uh, as we have said many times his unmerited and undeserved favor towards sinners. In other words, saints are sinners who have been forgiven of all their sins because of what Jesus has done. We do not become a saint by way of choosing or by trying to do good works as Roman Catholics do. We become saints only because of what Jesus has done, because His grace has been given to us. Okay? Right? So, in other words, saints are sinners who have been forgiven of all their sins because of what Jesus has done. Therefore, they can be at peace. You can be at peace with God and receive peace from God. So, in verse 3, Paul says, I thank my God. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you. So, I have a question for you. Uh, when you remember other believers, other Christians, what generally comes to your mind? This is a very important question. Gratitude? Are you grateful for other believers? Or 
complaints or internal rumblings and 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 a sense of self-righteousness a condescending attitude right is your heart at rest is your heart experiencing peace in that way or is your heart always comparing with other believers right are you jealous are you driven by envy or is your heart at peace with God is the grace of God real in your heart right so in verse 3 I thank my God Paul is grateful for the believers in Philippi I thank my God in all my remembrance of you now the root word for thank Eucharisteo in the Greek is in verse 3 is charis meaning grace the root word there is charis meaning grace that's the same word we get in verse 2 grace charis and from the same word comes kara joy in verse 4 right it means thankfulness and joy comes because of God's grace because of experiencing God's grace peace comes from God's grace joy comes from God's grace thankfulness gratitude comes from God's grace grace needs to go from your head to your heart he says in verses 3 and 4 I thank my God that's personal when was the last time you prayed to God and you said my God my God personal it's a sense of intimacy there is intimate relationship that he has with his God he doesn't just say God he says my God it is personal and he says I thank my God in all my remembrance of you always in every prayer of mine for you all making my prayer with joy kara the, the, the root word is the same with grace so so joy comes from God's grace right peace comes from God's grace and prayerfulness comes from God's grace interesting prayerfulness awakens pray, uh, uh, grace awakens prayerfulness and joy comes from God's grace and so what is the opposite of joy anyone sadness right in the culture that we live in people think that the opposite of sadness is happiness and I would say even uh, uh, the average uh, Christian tends to think that the opposite of sadness is happiness so you look to your careers dreams and relationships to give you happiness those are legitimate pursuits you should find some measure of happiness in your pursuits as long as you do not make that the ultimate thing Right? But what happens, I have a question to you, what happens when your career, your dreams, your jobs and relationships do not go the way you wanted or the way you had anticipated? See, if we are honest with ourselves, our happiness runs away. Happiness runs away and sadness rises in our heart, right? In other words, what's the difference between happiness and joy? Right? what happens so why does your level of happiness rise and fall based on how good your external circumstances are so if your external circumstances go straight this way you experience comfort right and I would say you feel like you don't need God you forgot on him your, your focus is on your circumstances when cir your circumstances are rocked by difficult moments they're shaken God in his sovereignty uses that and then sadness comes because it's rattling now right there's a shaking coming and then you start to realize this is I'm sad that's part of being human but if you live life like that you will not experience joy right so why does your level of happiness rise and fall based on how good your external circumstances are it means see you've put too much hope in your external circumstances to give you ultimate happiness you've put too much hope you've set your hopes too much on your external circumstances to give you the ultimate happiness that cannot be found in your good circumstances it means, see, you've been searching for ultimate happiness in all the wrong places where it cannot be found. Keep in mind, Paul's external circumstances were not great. He was persecuted and imprisoned by the Romans for his religious beliefs. And yet, he does not have this victim mentality. He's not blaming others or demanding justice. He's not crying out justice from his prison. He's not depressed over the circumstances that are beyond his control. He is in prison for crying out loud. He was stripped of his dignity in Acts chapter 16. He was thrown into prison. He was flogged before he was thrown into prison in Acts chapter 16. 
And yet, he does not have this victim mindset. He's not calling out for injustice. He's not complaining. There is no bitterness in his heart. Instead, what does he do? Inside the prison, he prays with joy for those who are outside the prison. He prays with joy, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, making my prayer with joy inside this prison cell. <laughs> Where did the joy come from? See, nothing can take away this man's joy. They threw him in prison. He's making his prayer with joy. He has not stopped praying inside the prison because he has been a prayerful man outside of the prison. And he's able to encourage those who are outside of the prison from within the prison with joy in his heart. See, it means you can have joy in Christ even when your circumstances are not in your favor. Don't you want this kind of joy? Because I was preparing this message and the Lord was filling me with more joy. Because I couldn't take my mind away from such a great example of finding joy in prison, not even in the rhythms of everyday normal life. When circumstances are not working against you, you're persecuted, you're suffering injustice, you're not calling out for injustice, you're not blame shifting, you're not pointing fingers at others, you're not angry and bitter towards others. There's joy you're experiencing. Where did that come from? From God's grace. God's grace became real in prison. You cannot do anything to this man. You cannot take away his joy. Because why? His joy is not based on how good his circumstances are. His joy is based on what Jesus has done. His joy came from the grace of God. Grace to you and peace from God. He says. So here we see again that Christianity is not a joyless, dutiful religion, isn't it? Paul says, I thank my God whenever I remember you and pray for you with joy. So if you're a Christian, I have a question for you. Is your life marked by, is your prayer life marked by thanksgiving? Is your prayer life mostly, please, please God give me this, or is your prayer life marked by thanksgiving in the grace that has been given to you? Another way to say it, is your prayer life marked by the gospel? Is it gospel-centric? Is it based on what Jesus has done? Are you grateful that you have received this grace? Or are you always crying and petitioning and saying, Oh, please give me this, please give me that, when life doesn't go away with your way? Or are you experiencing joy through prayer? Because he says, always in every prayer of mine, for you all, for you all, making my prayer with joy. He doesn't even ask at this point that they would come and set him free from prison. His prayer life is for them. <sighs> Does praying feel like a burden to you? Does prayer feel like a religious duty and not a means of grace and joy? Is prayer, does prayer feel like a means of grace and joy to you? Or does prayer feel like a religious burden? Do you feel burdensome to pray for others? When people tell you their problems, do you feel like the idols of your comfort are challenged? Because suddenly you feel like, you know, uh, I can't handle other people's problems. I have my own problems. No. Or do you feel the liberty, the freedom to pray for them with joy, not with sadness or sorrow? Do you have the joy? Have you ever had the experience of praying with joy for people? For Paul, see, prayer is a means to maximize his joy, not minimize it. Because for many of us Christians, we run around thinking, oh, prayer is so burdensome. Forget about prayer. I mean, I'd rather go watch movie. And then after the movie, your heart is empty because you're not connected vertically. You have never experienced the joy of prayer. And therefore, it's so far from you. It's so far from your vision of Christian life. It's just so far because you haven't tasted it. Only when you tasted it do you experience the joy. The very means that God has given you, a means of grace for your joy. God is after your joy because we think, oh, this is so burdensome. If I pray, then my, uh, my freedom is going to be taken away. I'd rather hang out with my friends. I'd rather watch a movie. I'd rather indulge myself, go to that restaurant, taste that beer over there, taste that wine or whatever. So, television. 
entertainment, video games. That's the level that we are playing. And as C.S. Lewis famously said, the Lord finds our desire not too strong, but too weak. We are half-hearted creatures fooling about with drink and sex and ambition when infinite joy is offered to us like an ignorant child who wants to go on making mud pies in the slum because he cannot imagine what is meant by the offer of a holiday at the sea. God is saying, come, drink from the fountains of grace. Drink from the fountains of grace. And I've given you the means of joy, prayer. He says in verses 4 to 5, notice there, I always pray for you with joy because, notice that, of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now the word partnership is translated as fellowship, contribution, collection, commonality, community. It means partnership in the gospel is the opposite of consumerism. Partnership in the gospel is the opposite of consumerism. It means Christian fellowship is more than enjoying one another's company, even though that is part of it. It means Christian fellowship is more than potluck party, a fun time, or a happy clappy time. Notice Paul's joy came from their partnership in the gospel from the first time he preached to them in Acts 16, 14 to 15. What added so much joy to Paul's heart was that this church took the gospel seriously. Right? He said, notice that. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. So, the grace of God makes you peaceful in verse 2. The grace of God makes you thankful in verse 3. The grace of God makes you prayerful and joyful in verse 4. The grace of God strengthens our partnership in the gospel in verse 5. And next we see the good work that God works in us. Right? The good work that God works in us. Look at verse 6 with me. Uh, and I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. It is right for me to feel this way about you all, because I hold you in my heart, for you are all partakers with me of grace, both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Verse 8, for God is my witness. How I yearn, how I yearn for you all with the affection, the affection of Christ Jesus. Notice verse 6. Paul says, I'm sure of this, that he who began a good work in you, the Bridge Fellowship, will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Do you have a fear of the future? Do you have a legitimate fear of the future? Because if you are in Christ, here's a promise for you. Take a look at this. Paul says, I'm sure of this. <laughs> what, is, what is he so sure of inside the prison? He's suffering in prison, and yet he says, I am sure of this, that he who began a good work in you will, will. Whenever the Bible says will, notice, underline those words. It's a promise. Go and underline all the promises of God and hang on to it. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. Look at verses like that and underline them, memorize them, hang on to them, believe in them. God will bring it to completion at the day of Jesus Christ. See, this promise is not just for tomorrow, but it will be completed at the day of Christ. Further in the future, at the day of Christ, He will complete it. Do you see how the promise of God is not just for your tomorrow, it's for until, until Christ comes back. In other words, God is so faithful to, to you that He will complete the work that He began in you <laughs> until the day of Jesus Christ. So, why would you be so fearful of what tomorrow brings if the promise is for eternity? Let me say it this way. If you can trust God for your eternal, eternal, not tomorrow, eternal salvation, why not tomorrow? If you say you're a believer and that you can trust God that on the day of Christ He will not damn you to eternal damnation but that He would save you and embrace you and justify you. He has already justified you if you are in Christ. But on that judgment day, how do you know? <laughs> right? On the day of Christ, 
If you can trust Him for the day of Christ, why not tomorrow? Right? Why would you be so fearful of what tomorrow brings if this promise is for you for eternity, not just tomorrow? See, that's the hope of Christians. Look, Paul's confidence is not in himself. I love that. Or in the circumstances around him. His hope is not on the circumstances around him. His confidence lies in the faithfulness of God who began a work, a good work, in the heart of the Philippians, right? It means this, if you're a Christian, your vision of life does not end here on earth. You look forward to the day of Christ, to the day when Christ returns to heal all the brokenness of this world and restore all things, right? Let me say it this way, your dreams are too small until they line up with God's vision to restore His kingdom on earth. Your dreams are too small until they line up with God's vision, bigger vision, to restore His kingdom on earth. Your career, your vision of your career is too small until you align your career with the larger vision of God's vision to restore His kingdom on earth. In other words, every story, your story finds its fulfillment in God's vision to renew His kingdom on earth. Until the day of Christ comes, God's plan and His promise is to renew the entire world with all of its brokenness, with all of its sin, with all of its evil. He will make all things beautiful. And so your job is to realign yourself with God's vision, with God's purpose. Every job you take, every career you pursue is just a small flicker in light of the bigger vision of God. Uh, purpose to renew and restore his kingdom on earth right and bring his kingdom on earth so I have a question have you been discouraged lately have you been severely discouraged discouraged lately Paul says here's a promise for you today he who began a good work in you will bring it to completion at the day of Christ so believe in that rest in that truth Notice it doesn't say, what you began, you will bring it to completion. God does not leave the work that He starts in you for you to, leave, to finish it alone. What He began in you, the good work of saving you by grace, He will complete it at the day of Christ. The grace of God will sustain you to the end. That's what He's promising. This is remarkable. I was so blown away doing my devotion the other day, reading this again. I have read this verse so many times and this chapter so many times. This verse was a beauty. The promise of God became so alive to my soul again. I was taken aback for a moment. I shared it with my wife. Go share it. How, how, how could you possibly, possibly find something beautiful and keep it for yourself? I don't understand. <laughs> When you see a beautiful baby, you say, that's so cute, that's so kawaii. It doesn't take effort for you to speak it out. How can you see the majesty of God and keep quiet? I don't understand. It doesn't work that way. It doesn't work that way. The human heart doesn't work that way. You, you will commend whatever your heart finds beautiful and majestic without telling people. If you find a gorgeous mountain where the view is so great, you will naturally tell people, oh, what a beautiful view. You will take a deep breath and say, what a grandeur, what a majestic picture. Take a look at this. Take look, 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 look. <laughs> it is beautiful. That's what the human heart does. How about God? How about the grace and mercy of God? Is your heart caught up by it? Are you able to say, look, look at the grace of God. Look at the peace that He has given me. Look at the joy. Look at the joy of saving me that I was a wretched sinner. Maybe you don't believe you're a sinner. Maybe only you believe it in your head but not in your heart. That's why you don't feel it in your heart. Your heart is dead towards God. You're spiritually dead still. You need to be awakened. Don't call yourself a Christian until your heart is awakened by the grandeur and the majesty of God. Otherwise, you will fool yourself into eternal damnation. It is a scary stuff. But take a look at the comfort here. What's the good work that God had begun? He's saying, He who began a good work of saving you by grace, in verse 2, the good work of giving you joy, the good work of renewing your heart, the good faith He started in you, He will bring it to completion. God does not leave His work halfway. He'll finish what He started. He does not start something in you and leaves you to complete it in your own strength. See? 
Paul is saying, if you are a child of God by grace, you can rely on His grace to complete the good work that He started in you. Your God is faithful and He can be trusted to the end. He will not lie to you. See? And in verse 7, he continues what he had said in verse 5. He says, it is right for me to feel this way about you all because I hold you in my heart. <laughs> what does it mean to hold people in your heart? See, you cannot have a self-righteous, critical heart toward others if you know you're saved by grace alone in verse 2. Right? How can, you, how, can you, how can you look down your nose on anybody if you're saved by grace alone? If you didn't contribute anything to your salvation, if it was the sheer grace of God that saved you, how can you be proud? How can you look down on others? How can you be critical of others? Grace takes away those things. In fact, self-righteousness is what prevents you from experiencing true joy in your heart. Because you're always comparing yourself. Self-righteousness is always looking at others and, how you, and trying to feel better about others. You're always critical of others, looking down on them. Your heart is restless. Your heart must find its rest in the grace of Christ. And when your heart finds in the gr rest in the grace of Christ, comparison is such a silly game. You won't be playing it anymore. You'll be more at peace. Your heart will be less busy because you're not comparing yourself with others. The only one you're comparing yourself with is God. And you know that His standards are so high you can't keep it. And therefore He sent His Son Jesus Christ to save you. And you're saved by grace alone. And so comparison is gone. Because in comparison to Christ, none of us can stand before Him. He's holy, we are not. He gives us His grace. right? And therefore we are free. You're finally free, your heart. There's, no, there's more peace coming in. There's more joy coming in because now you stop comparing. You don't have to look at others in a different way. In fact, you will be free to hold people in, in your heart. That's what he says. See, notice he says, for you are all partakers with me of grace. This is the good work that God was working in Paul's life, right? Paul affirmed the work of God's grace in others. When you look across the room here, you will see the evidences of God's grace, God's grace in people's lives. Call out those evidences of God's grace. Affirm them. Call it out. Acknowledge them. Affirm them. Encourage people and say, this is the gift of God's grace in your life. I see it so clearly. It's so good. Paul was doing that. I hold you in my heart, he says. Not flattering, but affirming the gracious work of God in others is an extension of your joy. Your joy is not just vertical. Your joy also is horizontal. You affirm the evidences of God's grace. That's what he says. For you are all partakers with me of grace. Paul affirmed the work of God's grace in others. And he says, you are sharers with me of grace. Both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. Take a look at that. That's meat. It means, see, Christian fellowship is more than just a fun time or a dinner time together. That's cheesy. That's superficial. It must go deeper. Both in my imprisonment and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel. The Philippian church did not run away from Paul when Paul was thrown into prison. That's true Christian fellowship. If you run away from your brothers and sisters when the mission gets hard, you haven't shared in true Christian fellowship yet. Not to this depth yet. Look at the depth of Christian fellowship here. It goes deeper than sharing meals together, which is great. It goes deeper than fun time together, watching movies together. It goes deeper into sharing in the suffering of Paul. Because Paul was suffering in prison for the sake of Christ. Sometimes it's not the gospel we are defending. But it's our space, our time, our resources, our energy from others. Why? Because as Eugene Peterson, a well-known pastor, uh, said, the kingdom of self is a heavily defended territory. The kingdom of self is a heavily defended territory. There's often an idol, an idol of comfort that we love to defend more than the gospel itself. But if you know you're saved by the lavish grace of God, so you won't hold back anything. You'll be wanting to defend the gospel. Look at the Philippians here. They shared with Paul in the mission of defending, doing apologetics. They are defending the truth of the gospel. God does not need to be defended. His gospel needs to be defended from distortion. And so they shared in defending the gospel. They were not ignorant of the gospel. Their, their partnership, their fellowship was centered around defending and confirming the gospel. 
This is amazing. That's what the good work of God was doing. That was the good work God was doing in them, that He would bring it to completion. The good work of defending and confirming the gospel. They shared in Paul's suffering with sufferings with tears and sweat. This is what Paul says in verse 8. This is why he says this. For God is my witness, how I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. This is a remarkable, remarkable statement. Pay attention closely. See, the grace of God had awakened such affections in his heart for Paul. Not just saying, hi, how are you doing? How, where do you work? Beyond that, affections in the heart. Grace has awakened that affection for the Philippians because of their partnership in the gospel. Their fellowship with the Philippian church was so strong. It was much deeper than getting together and enjoying things together. It was even in suffering. When Paul was in prison, they partnered with him with tears and joy. That to such an extent that this church was so dear to Paul's heart. And he says, I long for you. I yearn for you. Do you yearn for Christian fellowship that way? Or do you feel like Christian Christian fellowship is a burden. Church fellowship is a burden. If you feel that way, underneath those things, your heart, you have not experienced the liberating grace of God. Paul, who was in prison, was yearning for fellowship. He was wanting to go to church in Philippi and enjoy that fellowship with other believers. I yearn for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ, he says. It wasn't his affection. It was the affection of Christ for his church, and Paul was sharing in that affection. It was the affection of Christ. That comes about by receiving the grace of God, by treasuring the grace of God, by resting, receiving the peace and the joy that comes from God. Right? This is amazing. Jesus' affection for you has become my affection for you, he says. And this is one of the things I pray for myself. I want my affections to be awakened for each and every one of you so that when I pray for you, I'm actually praying as though you are my real daughters and brothers and sisters. I pray that way because I want this so much for my life, the joy, but also the joy of praying for you, the joy of uh, fellowshipping with you. And so here is what to Christian fellowship it it goes from the heart it comes from the heart right because across to this world right you have all of these meetup groups and all kinds of social groups and none of them share this none of them are awakened by the grace of God everything else is superficial it'll go away right in the society we're good at that but this goes deeper see it is grounded in the affection of Christ incredible in other words church your heart won't be cold or indifferent towards others if you have been awakened by God's grace. So, the grace of God makes you peaceful. The grace of God makes you thankful and prayerful. The grace of God, grace of God makes you joyful. The grace of God strengthens our partnerships and awakens our affections for others. Finally, we see the fruit of love that overflows through Christ. Verse 9, And it is my prayer that your love may abound more and more. I just want to say this. If you want to know how to pray well, look at Paul's pattern of prayer. And it is my prayer that your love may abound. That is overflow. Abound means overflow. Increase more and more with knowledge and all discernment. Verse 10. So that you may approve what is excellent and so be pure and blameless for the day of Christ. Verse 11. Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes through Jesus Christ, through the glory and praise of God. Look, Paul's prayer is that their love for one another may abound. Uh, think of a flower from a bud to full blossom. That's the image. That their love may abound, increase, overflow more and more, right? That's the kind of growth we want to see in our fellowship, right? We are after the heart. We are after love that comes from the heart. We are after love that is without hypocrisy. Love that is overflowing. Not loving one another less and less. Loving one another more and more. Right? He prays. And so Paul prays. How do you grow love in the church? You pray for love. Why? Because the love that we are supposed to give one another does not come from us. It comes from God. It's the agape love kind of love. It's unconditional love. It's the love of Christ that, is, that, that the grace of God has imparted in our hearts. That's what we should pray for. 
If you have a hard time loving people, pray for love. Pray that God will give you the love that is necessary to love them. Pray that God will fill you with His love so you love them more and more. He prays that their love may overflow with knowledge and all discernment. Interesting, isn't it? It means love is not sentimentality that only affirms us but never speaks true to us. That's not what love is. Interesting, isn't it? It means love is not so saying, oh, kawaii so only. It, that's not real love. Love is not sentimentality. The kind of love that he prays for the Philippian church is with knowledge, with the knowledge of God and all discernment. You need discernment in how to love people well. And he's saying pray for that kind of discernment. It's the kind of love that leads to purity and blamelessness. It's not the kind of love that only affirms you in your sin without calling you to repent. It's the kind of love that leads to purity because sin will kill you and someone calling out your sin is a loving thing. Incredible, huh? Sin, this kind of love is not only affirming someone in their, in their sin, but calling out that sin, calling us to, to repent and grow so that our love for one another is pure and it, it's built on holiness. Incredible. And this leads to uh, blamelessness for the day of Christ in verse 10. It's amazing. And notice this, this is the second time he mentions the day of Christ. Uh, maybe you're new to Christianity and wondering what does this mean? What does it mean to be pure and blameless for the day of Christ? See, according to the Bible, if you're not blameless from sin internally, not just in your moral behavior, there will be a judgment day on the day of Christ. That's what Paul means. The day of Christ involves judgment for those who are outside of, the Christ, outside of Christ. That's what I asked you in the beginning. Are you in Christ or are you outside of Christ? Because we will face this judgment day on the day of Christ. Everyone will stand before Christ on that day. So how can you become blameless and escape this judgment? By receiving Christ as your Savior. By receiving the gift of grace, the forgiveness of sins that He offers to you on the cross. See, the grace of God will give you peace, make you thankful, make you prayerful and joyful, and make you pure and blameless. Pure and blameless here does not mean perfection. It means an increasing likeness to Christ. This is the work of God's grace in believers. So if you are struggling with sin today, be encouraged. I want to encourage you. He who began a good work in you will bring it to completion. You have been given grace to overcome sin. And even though it may feel, not feel that way right now, He will give you the grace to overcome that. He will make you pure and blameless, prepare you for the day of Christ. That is His promise. That is the work of sanctifying grace that God is doing in His church. That He is preparing us for the day of Christ. So that we will be presented to Christ pure and blameless as the bride, the church. That's what Paul was saying. Look at verses, verse 11. Lastly, Paul's prayer is that they be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Where do you get that righteousness from? See, from Jesus Christ. See? He prays that they be filled with the fruit of righteousness. Right? Filled with the fruit of righteousness that comes, that comes through Christ. In other words, you cannot bear fruit apart from Christ. You can only bear fruit if you are in Christ and through Christ. Those words are very, very important. If you are in Christ, you will bear fruit. He prays that they be filled with the fruit of righteousness. See, the grace of God makes you righteous in Jesus Christ. If you have for, repented of your sins and believed in Christ and His saving work, then He grants you the righteousness of Christ. That's what calls, enables, that's, what, that's why God calls you saints, because you have been given the righteousness of Christ. You are no longer just sinners. You are saints in Christ by the grace of God. Right? Jesus, the only righteous one, received the judgment that you deserve in order that you might receive the forgiveness that you didn't deserve. It means the righteousness you now have is a gift from Jesus Christ. You do not have to earn that. He earned it for you. So how, this is very important, church. How you see yourself in light of what Jesus has done for you is key to your joy. 
How you see yourself in light of what Jesus has done for you is so key to your joy. Right? Let me say this. Because Jesus was made sin, you're a saint. He took your sin, he gives you forgiveness. He took your shame, he gives you honor. He took your pain, he gives you healing grace. He suffered mentally and emotionally to bring you peace. He suffered the righteous judgment of God to be at, so that you will be at peace with God. He took your rejection on the cross and gives you his acceptance. He takes your nakedness and clothes you with his righteousness. Christ has done for you what you could never ever do. The righteous one and the pure and blameless one was made sin for you so that you might be made righteous before God. Therefore, no lies of Satan, no voice of evil or sin can accuse you or condemn you before God the Father if you believe in Christ. No lies of Satan, no voice of sin, no voice of evil can accuse you or condemn you before God. Rejoice in that. Take joy in your salvation. Take joy in your righteous standing with God. Take joy that you are a forgiven saint today. The fact that you are forgiven, not only are you guilt-free, that you can experience this vital living relationship with God who has given you so much grace. Take joy in that. Take joy that you're a child of God by grace. So finally, what is the fruit of righteousness in verse 11? Love. Because in verse 9, he had prayed that their love may abound more and more. The fruit of righteousness is love that overflows through Christ. It is the fruit of God's grace working in our lives together. It is the fruit of God's grace working in the bridge fellowship. In other words, if we are clothed in Christ's righteousness, we will be overflowing with the fruit of love. And because this fruit comes through Jesus Christ, Paul says, it will be to the glory and praise of God. God receives the glory and praise for His grace, the work of His grace in our lives together. Would you stand and pray with me?